In today's lecture, we're going to be covering the Roman Empire. We'll first take a look at the early empire, which dates from 27 BC to 96 AD. Julius Caesar becomes dictator somewhere around 48 BC when Rome is still a monarchy. Caesar is then assassinated and civil war breaks out. Caesar's nephew Octavian rises to power and establishes a peace that lasts about 50 years and is given the name Augustus and we have the golden age of Rome beginning. Augustus also holds the title of Pontificus Maximus or high priest so he holds a tremendous amount of power. Make sure to know this sculpture this is Augustus of Prima Porta and the reason we call it that is it was found in his wife's villa in the city of Prima Porta. How would you like to have a life-size marble sculpture of your spouse just hanging around your home? Originally this would have been made in bronze but there were a tremendous amount of copies made and placed throughout the Roman Empire. This was really um, a sculpture that dealt with political propaganda. The idea that even though Augustus may not be in your city, that this is still the person who is ruling your empire, that is the lead or the head of the entire government. Back in the day, of course, there were no photographs or television, definitely no internet. So this was a very personalized idea of putting the people in touch with the leadership. Keep in mind that being propaganda, the sculpture shows his likeness, the idealized younger self. He's more handsome, he's more athletic during this, uh, in this sculpture than he would be in real life. I also want to point out down at the lower portion of the sculpture just off to the left there is this small boy clinging on to his robe and this is Cupid the son of Venus. Augustus himself traces his ancestry back to Aeneas who claimed to be the son of Venus. So by doing this Augustus is making a argument that he is also a descendant of in this case a goddess and that makes him defi uh, makes him divine um, on the breastplate that you see in his armor off at the right that we have um, the god of the sky and the goddess of the earth so we really have the idea of him being a god taking place all over him this is the era Pacus, which translates to the altar of peace and I do have a link to a video online I'd like you to watch about this structure because it is so important and so meaningful. Augustus was the first emperor of Rome and establishes the Pax Romana which is the Roman peace is what it translates into. It's basically marking his triumphal military campaigns in both France and Spain that establishes this peace. The structure was found and reconstructed in the early 1900s under the rule of Mussolini. The altar itself is inside the structure and the exterior walls those are known as the precinct. And this is a, a structure that is entirely made of marble. This is also just like the Roman Empire, or excuse me, the Greek Empire, that we have structures like this that would have been originally painted very gaudy colors, um, even though we look at it today as something that is pure white. Uh, back in the day when this was erected, this would have been uh, painted very bright, very garish colors. 
The reliefs on the outside are pretty awesome. Over 50 varieties of plants identified in the lower register or freeze, along with some animals, birds, lizards, and frogs. In the top register, you'll find individuals as well as stories such as the founding of Rome. This is the Pont du Gard, which is a not only a bridge, but it is an aqueduct. And we find it in the city of Nîmes, France. And this is definitely a, a Roman construction, but during this time the Roman Empire uh, spread throughout really known Europe. And so this individual structure is in France. It is massive. It's 150 feet high, 800 feet across. The blocks weighing up to approximately two tons each. The only part that's really held together by mortar is this top level here. And let me see if I can bring the cursor along the top. This is the aqueduct. And the idea is that this is taking water from its source to the city of Nîmes which is approximately 20 miles from the source. What this does is it really shows man's dominance over nature. And I can't stress this enough because in the early civilizations we looked at, such as the Middle East, those cities that grew up were stationed around major waterways, such as the Tigris and Euphrates. When we look at the Egyptian civilization, Egypt is based around the Nile River. But now we have the technology, we have the manpower to really take water and move it from its source to where it's needed instead of us living next to the source. So this is uh, monumental in terms of development of ancient civilizations. I'm also going to note that this is the first time we use arches in a major building project, and that is a very big deal. Because with arches, all of a sudden we can have much longer spans of uninterrupted space. We had looked at, even back in prehistory, we had looked at posts and lintel system. And we can create something maybe with a 15 or 20 foot span that is able to be constructed through that type of construction technique. When we get to corbeling, it's the same type of thing. We can here, we can create something that's 15 to 45 feet across without any visible means of support. But all of a sudden, you know, with the Pont du Gard, we have 50 and 60 foot spaces that don't need support. When we look at the Pantheon later in the lecture, that is 144 feet in diameter. Again, all the weight transmitted off to the sides rather than us needing supporting materials within the structure itself. So here's a close-up look at the base of the Pont du Gard. Uh, again, it is a, it is a uh, bridge. It serves as a bridge. Uh, it is over the Gard River. And the very top level that is the aqueduct that is moving the water. Make sure you know that it is the Romans that invent the arch. The Greeks, they gave us the orders of architecture, but the Romans gave us the arch. And this revolutionizes architecture. Taller buildings are made possible by the use of the arch. The idea of taking that weight and transmitting it off to the sides and then to the ground. Plus, we can do all sorts of things with arches. We can turn them 360 degrees and create a dome or a hemisphere. We can have them uh, stacked one behind the other to create a barrel vault. So we really have a lot of different opportunities to make things with arches. The way that arches are constructed are with these wedge-shaped stones called voussoirs. The last voussoir to go into place is called the keystone. 
And with the Colosseum, we're going to tackle that in the next video.